Turn your Bibles with me, if you would, please, to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. We're talking about the various judges of Israel. And guess what? The children of Israel have done it again. They have done evil in the sight of the Lord. How do we express that? That is sin. Judges 6 and verse 1, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, but sin always brings consequences, doesn't it? It doesn't just stop with sin. The sin ends up leading to what? Servitude. And the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the roots of the Midianites seem to go all the way back to Abraham and his concubine Keturah, according to Genesis 25, 1 to 4, and 1 Chronicles 1, 32 and 33. They dwelt, broadly speaking, east of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. But as we see in this context, the Midianites were not alone. There were other people who came with them, if you want to look in verse number 3. The Amalekites, who descended from Esau, Genesis 36, 12, and 1 Chronicles 1, 36, and the children of the east, which seems to indicate at least some of Ishmael's descendants. When you look at Judges 8 and verse 24, they were also oppressing the Israelites. In Judges 6 and verse 2, the Israelites have been forced into the mountains and virtually everything they owned was either taken or destroyed. When you look at Judges 6 verses 3 and 4, the Bible plainly states in Judges 6, 6 that Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, but they knew where to turn for help, didn't they? Sin, servitude, supplication. And they cried unto the Lord. They cried unto him and made supplication unto him. And in the context that we're going to look at tonight of Judges 6, 7, and 8, we're going to talk about Gideon. But the cycle of Judges, sin, servitude, supplication, salvation. The salvation in the book of Judges was in the form of the judges who were primarily military conquerors. Tonight we're going to talk about Gideon, altar destroyer. Four things we're going to suggest tonight with regard to Gideon, and here's the first one. The first one is Gideon the humble. Now I'm going to try to boil down as much of this as I can so that we don't spend a whole lot of time going through three chapters of the Bible. So we'll, we'll boil a lot of it down. Here's a brief background regarding Gideon the humble. The Lord sends an unnamed prophet to the children of Israel to remind them how they had been delivered from Egyptian bondage and that he had not forsaken them. They had forsaken him by not obeying his voice. That's boiling down Judges 6 verses 8 to 10. An angel of the Lord comes to Gideon by night, as it seems, according to Judges 6, 25, while he was threshing wheat by the wine press. Now, why was he doing that? It seems that he was doing it to hide it from the Midianites. According to Judges 6, verses 11 and 12, why would he hide it from them? Because if they caught him, they'd either kill him or steal it. So he had to hide it and did it down by the wine press, as it seems, at night. Now, Gideon expresses a sense of uncertainty in Judges 6 and verse 13, which I think surely would be understandable, wouldn't you say? How many of you have ever seen an angel from the Lord? No one. So how would you be expressing things if an angel of the Lord came to you and said, hey, guess what? You're going to deliver the Midianites. And be like, what? Are you serious? Now let's consider Gideon the humble from Judges 6, verses 14 to 16. Let's see what these verses say. Judges 6, 14, And the Lord looked upon him, that's Gideon, and said, Go in this thy might. He's giving him a little bit of reassurance, wouldn't you say? Gideon, you're, you're a pretty tough guy. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites. And then a question is asked. Have not I sent thee? Isn't this what I told you you were going to do, Gideon? Verse 15. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Now, where he was given a sense of reassurance in verse 14, here it really seems to express the humility of Gideon. Now, perhaps there's a hint of excuse-making here, but let's give him the benefit of the doubt. 
Let's give him the benefit of the doubt. And even Moses, if you'll recall what happened in Exodus 3 and really chapter 4, he began to make a lot of excuses, didn't he? So that's not uncommon, but let's, let's don't look at it from the aspect of excuse making. Let's look at it as Gideon is being very humble. Verse number 16, And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee. And thou, that's Gideon, shall smite the Midianites as one man. Now, let me give you an application regarding this. And if it wasn't enough for Gideon to humble, let's consider the application as readiness. The Bible teaches that we're to be ready for every good work. You say, well, where does the Bible teach that? Titus 3 and verse number 1. Which means that if we're going to be ready for every good work, we must first sanctify the Lord God in our hearts, which is exactly what 1 Peter 3.15 teaches. But sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and be ready always to give an answer to every man that asketh you a reason of the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Let me give you an example of a good work. The many times we kind of overlook this, but let me give you a Bible example of a good work. It's Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Brethren, if any of you be overtaken in a fault, ye which are spiritual, restore such an one in the spirit of meekness, considering thyself, lest thou also be tempted. Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. Is that a good work? Do we need to be ready to encourage the brethren who are overtaken in a fault? Well, are we ready to do that? Many times we're not ready because we may not be humble. We may not have the humility to do things like that. But that's something we can consider about Gideon. But let's move on. Second, let's talk about Gideon the Honorable. And again, we'll do this very similarly, give you a little bit of a background. Gideon asked this angel for a sign, perhaps it seems to make sure that he isn't dreaming, according to Judges 6, verses 17 and 18. And after preparing an offering of a young goat, which the King James expresses as a kid. Now, some of us kind of talk about our kids, and we mean our children. But when the Bible talks about a kid, it means a young goat. So he didn't offer one of his children. It was a kid as in a young goat. And unleavened cakes. This angel put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand, and the offering was consumed, according to Judges 6, verses 19 to 22. Gideon built an altar unto the Lord and called it, called it rather, Jehovah Shalom. You can read about that in Judges 6, 23 and 24. But let's pick up, for the sake of time, in Judges 6, beginning in verse 25. Now let's see what the Bible says here. Judges 6, 25, and it came to pass the same night. So that seems to indicate that all this is happening at nighttime. And in this, it plainly says, the same night. So everything that we've basically talked about so far, it's happened the same night. Wouldn't you understand it that way? And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years, and throw down the altar of Baal. Now, which, which altar of Baal are you talking about? That thy father hath. Whoa. We can see a little bit of Gideon's courage, can't we? He's been told to what? You need to go basically in your daddy's backyard and throw down the altar of Baal that's in your daddy's backyard. Now, it may not have been in his backyard, but I think you understand that figure of speech at least, don't you? Throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath and cut down the grove that is by it. The grove seemed to have been... Probably some type of a wooden pole, some kind of a carved image of those type things. So you're going to tear down this altar that's for Baal, and you're going to throw down the grove that's beside it. And incidentally, it's your daddy's altar and grove that needs to come down. Now, that would be difficult in and of itself, wouldn't you say? Having to go down and act against your daddy's religion, no matter what it was, that would be kind of difficult. Verse 26, not only are you going to tear down, but you're going to build an altar unto the Lord thy God upon the top of this rock in the ordered place and take the second bullock and offer a burnt sacrifice with the wood of the grove which thou shalt cut down. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. Verse 27, then Gideon took ten men of his servants and did as the Lord had said unto him. That's really what it boils down to. 
Are we going to do what the Lord has told us to do or are we not? Are we or aren't we? And what happened? And so it was because he feared his father's household and the men of the city that he could not do it by day that he did it by night. Now you see his instructions given in verse 25. Get rid of the idolatrous images, the idolatrous places and things of that nature. Now verse 26 is a little interesting, wouldn't you say? Oftentimes it gets kind of glazed over, but we'll deal with it just for a second. What tribe was Gideon of? Do you recall? We read it already. Do you remember he was the least of his father's house of Manasseh? Now is Manasseh the same as Levi? Mm -mm. Sorry, no it's not. But what did Gideon do? What, what was he told to do? He was to offer a burnt sacrifice. But yet He's not of Levi. He's of Manasseh. Well, how do you explain that? Now, here's the best that I can do. You need to recall that this was a very difficult time in Israel's history. Go back and read Judges 6 and verse 6. Judges 17 and verse 6. And Judges 21 and verse 25 sort of lay out the groundwork for the whole book. In those days, there was no king in Israel. But every man did that which was right in his own eyes. But understand... Why did Gideon offer that burnt sacrifice? Who told him to do that? God told him to do it. So if God tells someone to do something, what do you do? Think about what Abraham did with his son Isaac. When God told him to take his son, his only son, and go up to Mount Moriah and offer him as a burnt offering, what did Abraham do? He went. Now we can question God's reasoning behind certain things, but what did Gideon do? Gideon did exactly what God told him to do. So I wouldn't throw off too much on Gideon regarding that. But let me give you an application regarding Gideon the honorable. And that is respect. It's simply respect. We do what God tells us to do simply because he told us to do it. Let me give you something that is elementary and simple and basic. But I wish and I think you do too that everyone else would understand this. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. But he that believeth not shall be damned. Why do we need to be immersed in water? And according with Acts 2.38, why does it need to be for the remission of sins? Is it because we've concocted that in our own minds? Or is that what thus saith the Lord is? It's pretty simple, isn't it? Let me, let me give you one more. It's Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. Why do we sing? Why do we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? The answer is because we respect God. God told us to sing. He told us to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So what do we need to do? We need to be like Gideon and Gideon was told, you go over there, you pull that down, you pull that grove down, and you build an altar unto the Lord, and you do what I told you to do. What does that to us? Respect. Why are we baptized in water for the remission of sins? Because God told us to. Why do we sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Because God told us to. Let's move on. Third. Let's talk about Gideon the heroic. Again, we'll move on into chapter 7. But a brief background. God has determined, and I think most of us are probably most familiar with this aspect of Gideon. God has determined that Israel's army of 32,000 is too many. Judges 7, 1 to 6. And according to the Lord, 300 men, Judges 7 and verse 7, are sufficient against an army of 135,000. Now, where did you come up with that number? Look at Judges 8 and verse 10. It seems that there were 135,000 Midianites. At most, there were 32,000 Israelites, and God said 32,000 is too many. That's too many. He dwindled it down to 10,000. He said 10,000 is too many. And it dwindles down to 300. Now do the math. I'm not good at math, so I had to, I had to use a calculator to figure this out. But if it was 135,000 against 300, that's 450 to 1. That means if it comes down to fighting with swords, every Israelite is going to have to kill 450 of them. That don't sound like, I ain't real smart, but that don't sound like too good odds to me. Does it you? When it's 450 to 1, 135,000 to 300, but you know what? We don't ever forget.
for one moment need to doubt the power of God. And it goes right back to respect. Are we going to respect God enough to do what he says? In Judges 7, verses 8 and 15, Gideon spies out the Midianite camp and is given more assurance from the Lord, this time by what had to be an inspired dream and an inspired interpretation. So look with me for the sake of time in Judges chapter 7. Let's begin in verse number 16. And he, that seems to be Gideon, divided the 300 men into three companies. It seems that there were 100, 100, 100. And then Gideon himself. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitchers. And he said unto them, Look on me and do likewise. Now that, there's a lesson right there, but we'll, we'll keep on for the moment. And behold, when I come to the outside of the camp, it shall be that as I do, so shall ye do. Verse 18, when I blow with the trumpet, I and all that are with me, then blow ye the trumpets also on every side of all the camp and say, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So, verse 19, Gideon and a hundred men that were with him came into the outside of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch. Now, it seems at this time there were three watches in the night. There may be some debate regarding this, but it seems to be midnight. Some may say as early as 10 p.m., but it seems, you'll see, it's, it's dark. It is dark outside, no doubt. The beginning of the middle watch, and they had but newly set the watch. And what happened? They blew the trumpets and break the pitchers that were in their hands. And the three companies blew the trumpets and break the pitchers and held the lamps in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands to blow with all. And they cried, The sword of the Lord and of Gideon. Verse 21, And they stood every man in his place round about the camp, and all the host ran and cried. And fled. And the 300 blew the trumpets, and the Lord set. Now observe that. The Lord set every man's sword against his fellow, even throughout all the host. And the host fled. And you can read on, and I'm not even going to try to pronounce some of those words. I'm going to pull the Passover on that. You can read it for yourself. But they run off, don't you see? And some of them even, it seems, killed themselves or were killed by their. Their own friendly foes, I guess you'd have to express it as. Now, one thing we need to know about this is that Gideon had previously acted under the miraculous influence of the Holy Spirit. Go back and look at Judges 6 and verse number 34, and this was probably no different. Now, what, what kind of military tactic is that really? I mean, how do you explain that? You, you're going to have a bunch of lamps. You're going to have a bunch of pitchers. You're going to have a bunch of trumpets with 300 men and 135,000. You're going to go down there and slaughter them. There is no explanation for this other than this is the hand of God. And that was the purpose behind dwindling down that 32,000. They didn't want, God didn't want them to think by any means that it was by their own power and by their own might. So there's no great thing here about anyone other than Gideon was heroic and simply did what the Lord told him to do. Did it work? Did it work? Now we can sit here and try and rationalize and say, you know, this doesn't make any sense. I, I just don't understand how this is going to work. You don't have to understand how it's going to work. Has God said it? then let's just go do it. And he'll work the rest of it out. We don't have to even concern ourselves about that for one second. So here's the application. The application for us is reliable. That's all we need to be. Now, don't we see that God is reliable? Titus 1-2, in hope of eternal life, which God that cannot lie promised before the world began. Since God is reliable, what do we need to be? obedient. Jesus expressed it very concisely but very beautifully in John 14, 15. He said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Did Gideon demonstrate that? Yes, he did. Yes, he did, didn't he? So in that aspect, he is heroic in that he simply had courage enough to do what God told him to do. Now fourth, Let's talk about Gideon the Honest. And again, we'll be in Judges chapter 8, and we're looking at it very, very quickly, very broadly, but I think we can get the idea. Brief background. Due to humbly obeying God's instructions, Gideon has relieved, relieved Israel from Midianite oppression and servitude. Along the way, there were two Midianite princes and two kings of the Midianites who died. You can read about that in Judges 7.25 
and Judges 8 and verse 21. But let's, let's look for the sake of time at Judges 8, verses 22 and 23. Now, how would you react in this situation? Gideon at this time is no doubt a, a great military conqueror. He's done a lot of great things. Now, how would we react if this happened to us? Judges 8 and verse 22. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son and thy son's son also. How do you express that? that? Wouldn't that be expressed as what we would consider a dynasty? Gideon, your son, your son's son, your grandchildren, and it seems to be perpetual. We want you to rule over us, and just to let you know, we want your son to take your place when you go on, and his son to take his place when he goes on. Now look at it. Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy son, and thy son's son also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Now, what would you say? What would you say? Would you say, you know what, that, that sounds like, that's the best idea y'all have had in a long time. It's about time that you all recognized my greatness. It's about time that I got a little recognition, but you don't see any of that here, do you? Look at the next verse. Verse 23 of Judges 8, And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, Neither shall my son rule over you. Now look at this. The Lord shall rule over you. So he was offered a dynasty. A dynasty was rejected. And I would highly suggest that you go back to Deuteronomy chapter 17 and read verses 14 through 20 where God said the day's going to come. Hey, he told them. He told them the day's going to come where y'all want a king. And you need to understand, when you get a king, what all is going to happen. But if you're going to have a decent king, here's some things that he needs to do. And it seems that one of those things was to sit down and write a copy of the law. Do you recall any king doing that? Do you recall him saying, and even if that's just talking about the book of Deuteronomy, when's the last time you hand wrote out a book of the Bible? Have you ever done that? Have you ever wrote out an entire chapter of the book of the Bible? Give, give it a try sometime. Give it a try sometime, and you'll see there's a whole lot more that sticks when you look at that and you have to write it down and transfer it accurately like that. But I'm going to give you the application. The application is simply righteous. Honest men have no problem being second fiddle to God. Doesn't that make sense? An honest man has no problem at all being second fiddle to the God of all the earth. And we must all learn that when compared to God, we're nowhere close. There is no comparing us to God. Gideon said, look, you, you want a ruler? The Lord needs to rule. Not me. Who am I in comparison to the Lord? In Revelation 15, 3, the Bible says, And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God and of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Are we saints? Then who is our king? It is the Lord. Quietness was in the land for 40 years, according to Judges 8 and verse 28, and that was perhaps the rest of Gideon's life. Are you aware that Gideon's name is found in Hebrews eleven thirty-two? 32? Generally, you'll hear people express that as the hall of fame of faith. Gideon's name is mentioned in there. Now, while our names will never be written in the Bible, are you aware of that? Our names can be written in a very important book. You know what that book's called? That book is called the Book of Life. Are you absolutely certain tonight that your name is written in the Book of Life? Don't you want to be 100% sure that your name is written in the Book of Life? Well, what must I do? You have to hear the truth. Acts 18.8. 8. You have to believe the truth. Acts 16.31. You have to repent of sin. Acts 17.30. We have to confess openly and freely that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Acts 8.37. We must be immersed in water for the remission of sins. Acts 22.16. Then the Lord has added us to His body, which is the church. Colossians 1.18. Acts 2.47. And brethren, we have to be faithful unto death. It's not a, it's not a sprint. It's a long distance race. Acts 8.22. Wherever you are, come now. As together we stand and as we sing the song of encouragement.